Um, and it's your floor, Suki Swa. Thank you very much, Detlef. Good afternoon, uh, wherever you may be. In Manchester, where the sun is not shining like it is in Joburg. In Nairobi, in Kampala, all over the world where you are. Welcome to Virtually Yours, the second installment. And we are here with Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi, the author of Chintu, the author of Manchester Happened and the author of the most very beautiful written novel, The First Woman. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you for having me, Zahizwa. And thank you, Detlef, for making this happen. Jen, remember Pleasure. how, um, I'm gonna ask you maybe, before we get into all this, I'm gonna ask you to start by doing a little reading. Okay. And I can get into all my excitement about the first woman which is called in the US, uh, a woman is, is it a girl is a body? A, a, a girl is a swimming pool. You know, so a Kisuma woman is a swimming pool. Something. That. It's a girl is a body <laughs> of water. It's not a lady. All right, all right. <laughs> no one in the UK, in the US, as a, a, a girl is a swimming pool. But yeah. God, you're so lucky. I love you, but. I'm going to fight you one of these days. <laughs> I love you too. But can we, a girl is a body of water, guys. I finally got it right. But take it away, Jen. Give us a little reading. Okay. Um, I'm going to read the part you asked me to. That is when Chirabo visits in Sota. And uh, it's uh, the 20... It's the 5th of May. 1975, when um, uh, the conference, uh, the women's conference in Mexico City took place. There was a little improvement the next time Chirabo visited. Suta was in another run of her foul moods. She sat deep inside her dido, listening to the radio. When Chirabo announced herself, she waved for her to sit down and keep quiet. Nsuta sat as if coiled into herself. It was a live broadcast. There was a lot of static. Nsuta kept touching the antenna, bending it, turning it, straightening it, pulling it, pulling out all the segments, but the static persisted and the voices that echoed out of the radio sounded distant. From what Chiravo could gather, a big conference was going on in Mexico. It was in English, but it was for women only. Chiravo gave up on the radio, the static was too much. Can I look at your magazines in Sota? Sota nodded briefly. From the dates on the issues on top of the pile, the magazines were very old, some dating back to 1942, yet they looked almost brand new, no film of dust. Chirovo imagined the hapless ghost, Zuta's sort of slave, dusting, doing the chores. She flicked through the pile looking for drum magazine, specifically for the adventures of Spearman, a pullout comic that came with it. Its hero, Lance, Lance the Spider-Man, kicked crooks better than James Bond, better than Bruce Lee, all the while swigging with smoking a cigar. When she got to the bottom of the pile and there was no drum, she put them away. Chiravo turned to the radio again, but this time, two men were talking over the conference in Uganda. Their voices were crisp and clear. Apparently, the women at the conference were getting greedy. Have they seen us go into their kitchens or in their maternity wards? Have you not heard of Mwenkanunkano? My sister started talk, to talk about that nonsense and I told her that the day children will start to belong to their mothers is the day men and women shall become equal. Suta sucked her teeth long and loud. When the men finally stopped talking, it was possible 
to make out the voice of one of the conference delegates. Suta increased the volume. She seemed to hang on every word out of the radio. There was a round of applause, but it was soon overpowered, but more static. The Uganda speaker interrupted again and Munamasaka, the program for the Masaka region, came on. Chiravo held her breath. Nsuta stared at the radio as if she wanted to hit it. Then she snapped it off. Chiravo apologized for the rude men. It's terrible those men spoke over your program. Nsuta made a, ma a gesture that, that said that men could not help themselves as if to blame them was to blame a child for being childish. But the women were, the women too were, the women in the radio, Chirava was baffled. Yeah, they think they, they think that we all think the same. Was it wrong what they said? Not wrong, but this is the wrong start. If your roof, your roof leaks, what do you do? Find the, hole, plug it, and then mop. Those women, who sort of pointed at the radio, have started with mopping. I don't even know whether there was a Ugandan who took our voice there. And if there was, I don't know whose voice she took. Jirabo sucked her teeth at the women's brand of blindness. Even she, who was walking her 13th year, knew better. Even though we are all women, we stand differently. We stand in different positions and see things differently. The first thing should have been to should have been for our representative to rally us and say, you know, people, aren't you tired of this leaking roof? To make certain everyone, young, old, servant, mistress, may educated or not, willing or unwilling, is aware. Humans are funny. Some may not see the leak. Some may say, don't disturb us. We don't mind a little bit of dumb or a roof leaking is normal. That's the nature of roofs. Other women who sell mops might even encourage the leak. There would be some who would be afraid that once you start repairs, you will open up new holes. There are also some people in, the, in this world, but when you have involved everyone and heard their reaction, then you know how to proceed. He meant to walk away, but then returned, turned around. Soon, and I'm telling you it will be soon, those women will find out that the women they are trying to save are an obstacle. What about my story? What story, child? Our original state, not today, Chirabu. Come back another day. Thank you so much for that, Jennifer. I, I, Jennifer wasn't, wasn't going to be reading, but I specifically asked for that particular reading because I thought it centered the book so much. I remember how it essentially like punched me in the guts when I was reading it. And, uh, um, and I thought it, it said so much about feminism and Africa. You know, there has been the argument that uh, feminism is an African and, and you argue otherwise in this book. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, the, 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 the reality is that whenever um, people have been oppressed, of course, there were a, a feminist action. Uh, however, it tends to be uh, local, it tends to be individual, it tends to be life really. You know, the thing that your mom and my mom, the thing that your aunt and my aunt and our grandmothers did, you know, they all resisted, but they resisted as individuals or just a small group of relatives or friends. And it was very local, but they, they viewed it as life. So when feminism arrived with the term feminism and it was very large and it was in English, and there were um, all sorts of uh, pictures that came with it because you could see it on, on TV, you could hear about it on radio. It seemed as if, oh, finally, women are fighting for their rights, uh, as if that was the first time, but it has been going on for a long time. It's just that now Africans are putting it in words. And I think in, in, for a while, 
we took Western feminism and incorporated it into our feminism. So for since 75, there's been, of course, African feminism, uh, Africa womanism, you know, but all that was kind of taken off the Western feminism and made African. But what I'm suggesting is something that is indigenous, something that comes from us, from our grandmothers, that has been passed on for generations. And we are finally articulating it in English or a language that the rest of the world can understand. Thank you. you. And you do that so perfectly. You do that articulation so perfectly with Nsuta. You know, she is um, born and grows up when during a time when Buganda has its first, the, the, the Baganda have their first schools. But she decides that she's going to go to school and, um, and, and she's going to do, and she's so unapologetic right to the end of her life about who she is. Uh, did Ntuta resemble anybody in your life? Because I remember reading her and loving her so much. And I was like, oh my God, this is like my grandmother and my grandmother's friend and all these people that are, all these women that I've loved. And these were women who were born like in the, in the, at the turn of the century, uh, at the turn of the, turn of the 19th century. Did she resemble anyone in your life? Did you draw her using people you um, know? One, there's a, a legend in my family, um, mm. a, a woman called Victoria Nancha, and she was a sister to my great grandmother, to my great grandfather. But apparently mm. <laughs> this woman had 40 acres of land. And I'm telling you, my great grandfather was born in the 1800s, you know, mm. around the 1870s, I suspect, or 1880s. So has, his sister must have been born at that time. But apparently she had 40 acres of land. No one in my family can explain how she did. But apparently she had other women in, in her service called Abazana. Now Abazana are wives of chiefs, but <laughs> she had this Abazana around her. And then she used to marry men and then get rid of them and marry men and then get rid of them. And she got away with it. You know, I just don't know how. And in, in my family, normally when we go to the graveyards to dig around, we, we are shown her grave and we are told she was mad. And that apparently that madness, because that's what we call it, rather than she was a feminist, she was mad. So apparently within every generation, there are a few Victorian nunches who are mad. And once they are identified, <laughs> Uh, the family says, oh, that one is a, that is a victor. Just leave her alone. You know, so they get away with murder. But um, mm. it's, it's that woman that I was, um, I was building on. But I also had another great grandmother who, again, did not marry. She had her own house, but I saw this one. And sometimes I would go and stay with her for a week or two. But my great grandmother, she would at around four, she would get dressed and go to the bar with men and drink. She used to smoke. Mm. Uh, uh, that um, it was a cigarette called Kanta. Uh, mm. it's, it was an old cigarette, but she used to smoke. And I thought it was normal and natural. It was until I hit puberty, and I realized you can't smoke if you're a girl but my great grandmother used to. So it's those two women <laughs> that created Nsota. It's funny that you say that because it actually reminds me of my own grandmother. You know, she used to, she used to drink and my grandfather didn't drink. And um, I remember my cousins going and uh, my cousins and I, when we were young, we had to go and look for her and bring her home safely, you know, at night after she'd been drinking, but yeah. That <laughs> anyway. is entirely my great grandmother, honestly. You know, the, the kind of cigarette she used to smoke was Kali. <laughs> mm. it, it was unbelievable. 
when, when, when I finished reading your book, um, I called you in excitement, remember, you know. Yes. I mean, your books always excite me anyway, because you write in such a relatable way. And uh, one of the things that you and I have talked about is, you know, how, of course, you write beautifully, but you're also very much about telling the story. Can you walk us through your creative process when you when you when you're writing a book um i am all storytelling i am a storyteller but of course as a novelist it that is a given it's obvious so we normally don't talk about it but that ah, you can't be saying as a novelist that's given because there are other novelists who are all about the craft and not the story uh well when i read a novel i'm looking for a story so I'm, I'm going to write the story first. And I always get that right first. It's always the story. And of course, when it comes to the story, it starts with the character, the, you know, and that character's experiences and whatever they are searching for. So I always get that down first. And I work on it, perhaps that's what I work on mostly for a longer time. And then it's until that I'm happy with that, that I pick on some of the issues that are obviously arising in the story, because often you don't have to work hard for themes to arise. They arrive, you know, they, they, they emerge quite organically. And I then start to embellish those. There are some themes that I'm sometimes not happy with and I mute those and get rid of them. And, and then if I have other ideas that I want to use the story for, then I in incorporate them. But for me, the story is paramount. Okay, so some, um, some media house that we want to, we won't mention, I, I think it's some random media house from the West. Uh, called you, uh, called you Uganda's answer to Chino Achebe. What does that even mean, by the way? Look, uh, the West is very, very limited in understanding <laughs> African literature. All they know is Achebe. So if they read a good book, yeah, Achebe, right there. <laughs> You're like, seriously? We are a billion people. <laughs> this is a huge continent. It gave you Achebe, you know. Thank God it gave you Achebe. But Achebe has passed mm. on. He has left the stage. We are moving on, you know. I, I, I'm a woman. <laughs> they can't even find a woman mm. author to compare me to. But everybody, everybody that I know that has <laughs> been reviewed by certain people, is an is the new Achebe, you know, and I, I it in a way it, I understand that mm. they are saying that this writing is good, so I understand that comparative element, but for goodness sakes, uh, recycling is good for you know paper, but not for talent. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Can you not just? Can you be the Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi of Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi, you know? Oh my God, um, if I ever, you know, it's so wrong. One of the wrong. things that you do with... it, it limits me to Achebe. I can rise One of the things that you do. Mm. Absolutely. And we thank you for that, for saying that. Um, one of the things that you do in your, in your, in your, in your book, in fact, you do this, and, and, and I love this about your writing, and, um, you know, where you, you ask questions, you, you don't give answers, you ask questions, and one of the questions that you ask, and I remember calling you, like, when we're talking, when I, when I finished reading, about, um, about a, a feminism that goes beyond, uh, that sees beyond class, and, and, and you do this in this narrative with Chirabo and and Gibwa, for instance, or yeah. even with Chirabo's aunt, um, yeah. how, how, how classist is feminism and how classist is African feminism? Oh God, um, I, I think this is one of the gray area of feminism, uh, that the reality, the, the failure to see how class impacts uh, the idea of women coming together. 
because working class and middle class women and you know upper class women may not may be um may may be pulled apart more by class than anything else okay um in uganda class is a huge thing and we are we're still unapologetic about class you know out here in britain middle class women and very rich women are always uh, apologizing about their wealth and their privilege i know uh, I, I visited a friend who i didn't know she was very rich when we were together in class but when i got to her home oh my god she, she said i'm so sorry jennifer i'm really really rich mm. you know <laughs> but <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> Um, I suspect in Uganda, someone would be very, very, very eager to let me know how rich they are. That yeah. In Uganda, we do not, we, we are not aware that sometimes our wealth, our education, and all the things around us have been possible because there were other mm. issues other than us being hardworking, you know that they have fallen into place onto mm. our laps a lot mm. easier than they have for other people. So we flaunt our, our wealth, in, uh, of my, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. And so I, I, I wanted to talk specifically to uh, uh, women whom I know um, are reading my books and say, I mean, how do we handle this? Because often we bring working class women into our homes as servants, as heirs, as cleaners, or as cooks. How do we relate to them? How do we relate to their lack of privilege? And how do we help them? You know, try to find a way to, uh, to, to be able to talk across the divide. Because uh, you can see the Chirabo and Jiwa, they, as children, they're quite comfortable with each other. Although Chirabo, when she was made uncomfortable, she would pull out her, you know, her privilege and wave it in Jiwa's face. But when they grow up, it becomes entirely impossible for them to reconcile. And Aunt and, and Abby, who is a major feminist, does not see that. Absolutely not, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, 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 you know, when I when I read that, I was thinking about the women that that I've not I've known women who work at NGOs, for instance, and they will fight for like minimum wage for women, but they won't do that with the domestic workers at home. They will fight yes. that um, women should be able to like work certain amounts of hours, but they will expect their domestic workers to work seven days a week, you know? And, uh, but well, beyond, you know beyond, um, beyond, F feminism. Mm. beyond feminism, the other thing that you also really highlight is um, women's, you know, the fact that feminism itself is, is a certain type of privilege and uh, you question through Nsuta and through uh, Chirabo, that sometimes we should allow women to just to just be and make their own decisions about certain things. Um, you know, do you think that maybe this is like this is not a good thing that you were saying? Oh, okay, you know, let's let's just let's just let let other women be. Should should it be like? Should it be like? Okay, no, we need to turn everybody to become like this. We should all be feminists, or 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 no? Well, what's the story there? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't also want to channel my Ina uh, Jimamanda, but there I said it, we should all be feminists. <laughs> I could see you twisting yourself around it, and I was loving it. And finally, you came out with that. It's okay, Sfa. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty uncomfortable with telling other women how to think what to do and how, how to do it, you know? I am quite comfortable putting my argument forward and say, this is what I think, this is what I see. 
but what do you think? Uh, because, um, and this is why I hated evangelists, because they imagine you have no brain. But um, I, I, I felt that because every woman fights uh, this feminist fight in their life, yeah, because everyone does, we could talk about it as a, a collective and say, you know, I do this and, and I do this. These are my strategies. And, mm. um, and perhaps make it a, a kind of something that is known among us, you know, but something that is um, arising out, out, out of our experiences because our experiences as Baganda are so different from other, other people. And so through sharing, then women can make up their minds, what they want to be, mm. whether they would uh, um, take on other strategies from other people or whether to keep their strategies. Because I, I believe I, I, all of us are doing it. And uh, all women before us have been doing it. Okay. <laughs> but what... Um, what we would do by making it a collective is to share our experiences, you know, and to share our strategy mm -hmm. and to get rid mm -hmm. of all those strategies that are not working. That would work, you know, and I want to talk about uh, as uh, a strategy, as a paradigm for Buganda. Okay, but of course we all learn from each other. So um, I read black feminism from the West. I've read um, French feminism, Sixo, uh, British feminism. I've read around a little bit and I've learned from them, you know, what, how to talk about it in, in Buganda. But um, I'm not going to use them to come and tell Ugandans or the Buganda women that, you know, this is what you should do and this is how you should do it. You know, remember within feminism, we women negotiate with masculinities. Sometimes mm. they push forward and then they realize they're getting in trouble and then they make a tactical retreat, okay? Sometimes they mm. control, they negotiate. These are all um, strategies women uh, uh, use. But when you take all that into feminism, that whole idea of retreat sounds like you know def defeat. But these are strategies, and we should make room for them. Absolutely. And one of the ways that you make room for that in this book is when you highlight um, when you highlight the, the 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 school, you know, you you set up this particular school, which you said was fictional, but I swear it was my high school, you know, <laughs> and it's a girls' school, but there are women in this girls' school who uh, that women were like, there's a woman who's absolutely, there's a girl who's brilliant at science, but she decides that all she wants in life is just to be a married woman. She wants to find a husband and get married. She doesn't want to work. And then there are the women who are like the professionals, the feministas, and they can't understand this. Can you talk about that a little bit? Can you yes, that a little? <laughs> there's this crazy belief that if you are an intelligent, uh, a very clever girl in terms of Western knowledge, then you really want to be a scientist and go to the moon and <laughs> do whatever. No, there's so many girls out there who are um, good at mathematics, physics and chemistry, but they're thinking, yeah, I'd like to get married and have children and look after my man. Oh, my woman, you know? It's it's it, the idea that feminism pushes you to this idea of success, that success is through education, it is through um, Western knowledges, is absolutely dumb, you know? And this is where the girls were uh, uh, going wrong. And this is why the school then was split. Uh, girls who are feminists and the girls who are against feminism, now, which didn't make sense. 
And by the way, uh, I've had a lot of people, Africans who've read that book and have said, uh, yeah, I went to that school, Jennifer. It was called by another name. But actually it is, um, it is uh, there are bits of my secondary school, which is Tr Trinity College in Abengo, and a bit of my high school, which is uh, King's College Buddha. And, and perhaps 80% is imagination. But you can see that I was drawing from real schools, if everybody is uh, relating to it. Absolutely. I, will, I, I remember uh, I said, I think I might have sent a message to Hilda from, from FemRight as well saying, oh yeah, you know, uh, do, do you know this school, St. Teresa? <laughs> you know, I just said, uh, there are lots of St. Teresa's and stuff and everything. But I could totally relate to it. I went to a Catholic girls school in Zimbabwe and, and it was just like, this was my high school, you know? And, and, and up until today, I think uh, we all have those girls who then became like women, women, church elders, and then those yeah. ones who are crazy like yourself and myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but look at-, look at And not at, church elderly enough, <laughs> you know? That is true. But if you look into um, Milo's family, one of Chirabo's aunties, Guy, refuses to study mm. and says, no, I just want to yeah. go and yeah, get exactly. married and have my children. And, and that is giving me all um, my, my satisfaction. It's the way uh, feminism turned the domestic space into a place of oppression. Okay, that even when an author <laughs> writes a book focused on women uh, who are mothers or who are wives, oh God, so the women were so limited in domestic spaces, but there are women who find the domestic space, you know, empowering. And, and you know, I, I think feminism needs to move away from the, that kind of politics. Because it's disenfranchised. Okay. I can't say that word. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Can we also talk about how men's engagement with, with, with feminism, because you also bring this up, you know, um, how, uh, you know, Chirabo's grandfather is, is once is all about let's educate and empower the girl child and, and all that stuff but how he can deal with it in his own life, how, how Chirabo's father is the same way. And, and he is really close to her aunt Abby, who is, you know, who is fierce feminist, but he wants a certain thing from his own wife, a certain, a certain bending down, a certain, can we talk about that? Like men's engagement with feminism. What is that all about? Uh, it, it, it's, it's something that is crazy, especially in Africa and, and among black world, in the black world. Men will protect their sisters, they will protect their daughters, but most of all, they'll worship their mothers. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the women outside, the woman walking down the road, or sometimes their wife when things go wrong, then uh, the feminism flies out of the window. So uh, for me, uh, it's not a question of saying a man should be feminist. You know, they don't need to be told. They want the best for their daughters. They want the best for their sisters and they want their mothers to be treated as equals of course their mothers should be equals because they are goddesses but it's when they start to relate to the woman who is not their blood that uh, things become difficult and i and i think again this is where western feminism went wrong because it should have been aware of that mm. you know that men are at certain intersection, men are with us. It's only at certain levels that we, you know, we, we, we part company. And then we should have uh, harnessed 
those parts where men are with us and then fold the little gap where they're not. But because we did not, there's such a big ridge between women, between men and women in terms of feminism. And you know, Chintu, as I said mm. before, was all about men and how the patriarchy oppresses men. So for me, I started from there. I've always not identified with this feminism that pits men against women. And indeed, when I talk about Mwenkano Nkano, um, men are, there's no binary, you know, that man uh, on one hand and a man versus woman where feminism is concerned. We all agree at certain issues. We just need to work on a little bit more than men are willing to give. So this is why you have no problems with Milo until he mm -hmm. tells his, you find out that in the past he told Nsuta not to go to Gayaza and just go and settle in his house and have his babies. It's until you, 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 you find out that um, Tom has told his wife, pack your bags and leave my house. By the way, leave the children here because you didn't bring anything with you. Okay, or when Sia, who is absolutely aware, starts to do things that you're like, well, you're supposed to be a feminist. Mm. Right. But um, on to other news. How does it feel to also be a rich writer? You want like this large literary award and stuff and you know, while the rest of us are like trying to pay all like a one book or whatever, <laughs> but three books or five books. How does now, it feel to be rich? <laughs> Zukiswa, stop being jealous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to ask. I wonder. Like I'm like, wow, you know. I, I remember wanting to send you like a like a message when you won. I was like so excited. I was like, oh my God, Jen won this prize. But then I wanted to say like my friend, here are my account details, hey? <laughs> oh, I know, I know. <laughs> now, you know what? Uh, for me, you know, because- No, but I, what did it mean to you, like winning that? Uh, it meant I was vindicated in terms of money, in terms of payments, okay? Because remember when I left Africa, I had sold everything I had and put the money into studying. I didn't get, uh, I didn't come to Britain with uh, a whatever, you know, scholarship or funding. So I, and I worked and for 12 years, all the money that I worked went back into paying my fees and into my education. And I was mm. totally broke and in debt when that money came out. So. Oh God, it was unbelievable. I'm not in debt anymore. And <laughs> like this. I just don't understand. Uh, um, and, and, but also what that does is that, so I won that award and the university wrote to me and said, can we give you a job? So it's, it's that. that oh, that, wow. It, uh, yeah, I'm showing off because you're jealous. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it, it, it begets. You know, if you know, <laughs> and, and it, this is unfair. People who win awards then get on to be called to do this and be told to do that. So it's incremental. So in a way now, even though I, I, I teach only a few, just one time a year because I want to concentrate mainly on teaching, I, I still manage to get something to pay for, to pay my rent. And that is really fantastic mm. compared to where I was before I won that award. So it made the, I think it changed my life entirely. And it's gonna make me coming back to mm. Uganda a lot sooner than it would have been. Mm. Right, um, are you, are you planning, Jen? Are you uh, okay for all the universities who are watching? Um, I won the Gute Medal this year, so 
make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah. I, are you are you planning to to come back to the country? <laughs> of course. Of course, it's okay. So, and I've told you this over and over. Oh, have we lost you to Manchester? No, uh, God, Manchester is unkind to my joints. Mm. <laughs> the cold is ridiculous. But that's not the reason I want to come back. Uh, for me, when I set out to come to Britain, I planned to go back to Uganda. You know, I thought I would mm. do it in 10 years. Okay, it's mm. now coming. Next year, I'll make 20 years. But I still plan to come back. But I'm not going to just return because even my little house um you know room that i rented are not there anymore so i need to set myself up but also i need to make sure that i can that i can travel whenever i wish to because when you return to uganda sometimes mm. people put up a stop on your travel so i i need to set uh, things up in a particular way and then i'll return but i hope i'll be able to do it in the next 10 years yeah uh harriet says the character miro has her wondering whether one can be a feminist uh every now and then and that should be acceptable when it suits them and is that acceptable is there a box called feminism and one is either or not 100 percent so yeah where's well, your here, question miro here here's a fact those of us who call ourselves feminists there are certain things we do that are wrong, you know? It's just that mirror is put out in the open for the world to mm. see. But you know, I, I, someone like me can have a servant at home mm. whom I am uh, monetarily exploiting. Should, should I not be a feminist? I think um, as long as anyone is out there to make the lives of women better for me they are feminists and oh whatever they are because sometimes they they hate the term feminism uh they are but we can't ask for perfection because even feminism itself is not perfect Right. Uh, so I Kisha, your, your phone, your phone is off. So Kisha, we can't hear you. Your phone is off on your iPhone. You're talking through your oh, iPhone. No, I, I think send her a message because I don't think she realizes she's knocked off. <laughs> the... OK, we can't hear you. The microphone is switched off. Yeah. I sent. Yeah. Ah, it's no, back on. Yeah. But we still can't hear you. So, kiss what we can't hear you. Um, I think you were you you were um, connected to your laptop and now to your iPhone. <laughs> um, it looks like. He's trying to. Okay. And you to phone, yeah. But we still can't hear you. What is about your mic itself? <laughs> Did where well, haven't you been connected to your laptop before? Because I see you switch now. The camera switch now from uh, to your iPhone. Maybe you go back to your laptop. Um, maybe Jennifer, can I ask you a question in the meanwhile? Yeah. Um, is there uh, something in? Um, in view to have a German translation for your book? Or is it is it in the pipeline already? Or did you think about it? Um, no, for some reason, I haven't had uh, 
interest from German in, in terms of translating my books. Um, so far they've been translated to French, uh, Dutch, uh, Turkish, I think. Those are the three languages that have been translated to, but not yet to German. I, um, I don't know why, but I, I suspect it's because there's a, uh, there's a lack of handholding in my books. And most readers in Europe would like you to walk them around your, your culture. So I suspect that's mm. why. Okay. That's a pity. We would love to have a German version of your book as well. Um, one day it will happen, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure it will. There have been some interest, um, but um, none that I was interested or in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, the first woman is the... How, how, how many books... Uh, I've been published already from you. That that's your last one. It's no, that it is not yet published already. No, it's not launched yet. Uh, uh, the first woman. Yeah. It's been launched in the U.S. and in Britain. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's Please, my third book. Okay, because I couldn't get I couldn't get it here yet uh, in Namibia. Really? Not yet. Yeah. Oh. Yes, maybe also because due due to Corona they. Um, We, we had some orders uh, in February, they arrive now in November, so. Oh, right, so, yeah. okay. <laughs> But, uh, if you, if a bookseller gets in touch with my publisher directly, they'll get the books because they've been sent, the books have been sent to Uganda and to, and to Kenya. I know, okay. And I think they've been sent to uh, Nigeria too. So I see Barbara Sommer is also there with us. Do you have the book there in the Goethe Center already, Barbara? Yes, yes, we ah, have the book. Okay. <laughs> yes, we, we um, the African Writers Trust got a lot of them. So I bought several of them. So we have them, yeah, we have it. Oh, that's good to hear. Because, uh, oh yeah, I can see it. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's my personal. Okay. I think book. I think if you buy if a Barbara you buy a copy and send it to Detlev. Yes, be. to Namibia. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. That would yeah. be great. Good. So yeah, we can do that. Yeah. And also from my part, I I was also talking with uh, the director of African Writers Trust the other day about a German translation, but I don't have any um, relationship to German translators of these books, but I guess there could be a good market also in Germany, even if um, it's a lot of Ugandan culture in here, but um, it's really interesting. I, I think there is a market in Germany for this book. Uh, uh That, that left there are quite, quite a few questions I'm getting on the uh, from the readers. Can I answer those? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I was just uh, starting to read. Please go ahead. Yes, yeah. Uh, the first question I see is from Hilda. Hilda is asking Jennifer, there are great translators like Professor Chimba. Have you considered translating in, into Luganda? God, that would be the day. I think that would be the more the height. The height of my success if my books get translated into Luganda. And Professor Chiimba, remember he was my lecturer. He he taught me oral traditions. He's partly responsible for my interest in African oral traditions. So I wish he could translate my books. But I I don't know whether he will do it because Uh, Professor Chimba is also, uh, he has his ideas of uh, the theory of literature. And I remember he taught us the Islamic theory of literature and literature should be moral according to Islam. And certain aspects of my books may not be moral in that respect. And I don't know whether he can compromise with that and translate my books mm. but i yeah. when i come to uganda i'll try and look for him and put that question to him 
Okay. Uh, there's another one. How do you feel about your books with different titles in the US market? Well, um, I, would, I, I wish all my books had the same titles, but uh, I totally mm. understand where the Americans are coming from in terms of how Americans understand particular titles. So uh, the first woman in America is something that is known to represent women who have been the first to do this or the first to do that rather than the first woman on earth. So um, my publisher and a lot of booksellers in, the, uh, in America were saying, we will have problems selling this as a, a, a novel rather than a, um, you know, a memoirs or autobiographical, which talks about the first woman to go to the moon or the first woman to go to the, um, uh, whatever, to do whatever first. So the, that did not work for them. But for me, it was a book, it was a title that is in conversation with Chintu. So I kept it to that. But now that I'm aware, I am going to come up with titles that I, I, <laughs> oh, so Kiswa is back. Um, I know. Titles that but, but you know, you know how market. I made fun of uh, uh, that pond a title. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. I, I, I love that title. It's fantastic. The Americans are loving it. In fact, one American said that that title wins the award for titles. You know what, Americans, please buy the book. It's a fantastic title. It's just me. It's not Jen. Yeah, it's, it's not crazy. her publishers. It's just Thank me. Thank you. Thank but, you. It's crazy Zukiswa. Uh, there's a question here from, uh, I think it was Ranka, who asked um, about the curse. Yeah. That seems to resonate in, in both Chintu and, and, and the first woman. Maybe you can say something about this before... Um, we continue. Okay. Um, I think, uh, and I, I, I'm telling you, in the in the first woman, I, I didn't set out <laughs> to write about the cars. I swear, I wasn't even aware he was there. But I think the whole idea of a cars is something that is saturated in our understanding of the world. That when we, when we abandon. Uh, ideas of logic we run mm -hmm. into ideas of curse and especially where mental health is concerned we so quickly disappear into that and and i grew up with that idea of being cursed and in a way part of me is aware that there there's a, an aspect of life that we are all not in control of and that's where curse starts you know, and, mm. and so, of course, and that is a very frightening idea. That's a, you know, a frightening reality for a person like me. So I'm not surprised that it keeps popping up. I'll watch out in the next book. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another question here um, from Emma. She says, I know you've said elsewhere that you were working on this book for some time and then put it aside and published Chintu and Manchester Happened. Do you think it would have been a very different book if it had been your first novel? Absolutely, Emma. Absolutely. It would have been a very, very different book. Uh, the first version didn't deal with Mwenkanon uh, Kano. There was an Suta, but she mm. wasn't that big. She wasn't that imposing. Um, and uh, you won't believe this, but once I changed it and included um, in Suta's idea of, uh, you know, a woman coming from the sea, I wrote to one of the women uh, who rejected my book. And I said to them, thank you, because it's a better book now. You, uh, you know, she said to me, you're the first person to write back and thank us for a rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> um, in life in general, this is uh, from Harriet. 
There's a funny yeah. belief that women are emotional or their decisions are based on emotions. However, the women in the novel are deliberate in their decision. Would you agree that women are rational in their decision making whether to stay at home or end up as a nurse? And was this portrayal deliberate or it just happened as the novel unraveled? An example being Chirabo's decision to stay with Chio after the betrayal. Yeah, the, uh, did I say so, hear somewhere that women are emotional? Yeah, well, that's, that's uh, she said, uh, Harriet's question was, there is the belief that women are emotional. Oh. But, you know, but yet we see, not just from Chirabo, by the way, but also we see it from Jiba, we see it from Nsuta, we see it from all these women who are very deliberate about, about making their decisions, even when they decide to maybe become the, the other woman or, you know, even Auntie Abby, you know? We see it very, they, they do it very deliberately. So oh, yeah. would you say that it's a rational decision or, or oh, they're yeah. still doing it based on emotion? Uh, we, first of all, perhaps it's us only women who know that our decisions are not emotional. Mm. You know, you, 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 even falling in love is not emotional. Forget mm. that. This is why you don't fall in love with a handsome cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> It's not emotional. <laughs> Even the decision to cry mm. is not emotional because mm. you're going to find yourself not crying under certain circumstances where mm. you would cry for a similar, whatever happened to you, but not crying mm. in another. All mm. our decisions are calculated. And when it comes to calculating, we women are fantastic. We add one to one and we get two and we become emotional. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, it, you know, I, it, it's a very ma ma uh, man, masculine argument or idea that women are emotional, but we mm. use emotions to get us somewhere. When you see us being emotional, we have decided being emotional is the best decision in these circumstances. Well, there but why, you why are you revealing our secrets? I'm sorry. I just have to let the men know. You know, <laughs> oh God, we are so, so, when it comes to making decisions, women are fantastic. I've never been a man, so I don't know. But we are fantastic at making decisions. They are always cal calculated and rational. All of our decisions. And then we turn around and say, oh, I was emotional. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree with you. I, in fact, I was saying, I was saying to somebody, somebody said, oh, you know, this continent is not ready for a woman president. And I was saying, you know, um, women have been running households for ages. So, you know, what is, what is a country but a small, a bigger household? Anyway, 20 yeah. uh, something year old Ndegwa Nguru wants to know what Jen would have told 20 something year old Jennifer about writing. What, what would have been the tips? Uh, one, I would have told her that, first of all, get over yourself. Just <laughs> get over yourself. You're not <laughs> God's gift to humanity. <laughs> and then um, take it slow. Mm. Don't, don't rush. Mm. Uh, even when you finish a book in two years, put it away, start another book and come back to it a year later and read it. You discover that perhaps things you can do better. Um, I'll tell her to be humble. It took me a long time to get to that. Just, I, d I doubt she would listen to me. Uh, just to be humble and, uh, and be more friendly. Mm-hmm. But do, 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 don't, you, don't you think being humble is overrated amongst writers? I mean, we are already the humblest of art forms. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me tell you about authors. Our humility is an act. You, you, know, you know you have to be humble because you're an author. Look at the earlier generations of authors before us. Hmm. <laughs> you Men <know>. are free. <laughs> <laughs> Sister, sister, Ben is very humble. Well, by the time I met I agree. Ben, <laughs> humble. Uh, yeah, I agree. Ben that I've met so far is humble. But I'm I talking agree. about the, uh, 
the uh iris uh, Murdoch, the uh oh god what is his name he was born in east africa and he's asian oh oh i forget yeah. his name but oh, I, I, know, I know i know I, I know who you mean and uh i i'm sorry to kind of cut you off but um uh, do you understand? Can you believe that an hour has already gone past and our time is run out? I and I could have talked to you for another hour. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. What are I can't believe doing? it either. But Detlef sent me, sent me a message like, okay, listen, I know you two are beautiful African women and you, I like looking at you, but I also have to go and do my stuff. So, <laughs> of course, <laughs> I have to like, just be like, Okay, but before I go, there's, there's something that I promised that I've been doing. We did this with the first virtual yours, and we're going to do it with this particular virtual yours. And this is where we pick our books. We select winners. And I've got the book, the, the names here. And so I am picking up. Um, and um, first name. Oh, my God. First winner, Nachanza Malambo. <laughs> wow. Nachanza, congratulations. Nachanza, I understand, is here. And congratulations. Winner, congratulations, Nachanza. The dead goes to winner, South Africa. Yeah, she's in South Africa. Asanda Ndovu, is Asanda here? Uh, what number is that? Um, uh, they don't know, no? mm, I don't Asanda think so. Ndobu. Asanda is not here, unfortunately. That's no, a loss. Um, next winner is. Let me see. Uh, Zatunia Murangi. Is Zatunia here? I haven't seen. I didn't see Maybe it. Maybe I'm wrong. Zatunia Murangi, if you are, please say something in the comments. If not, going once, going twice, gone. Uh, next, next, next winner. Um, is Anna Timoteus here? Anna Timoteus. Anna, Anna, I should no. have done that. You're drawing first to people that are not here, or how do you do that? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I have the list that you sent me, Ditlev, yes. of people who have RSVP'd, and then I, 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 I pull out their names, and unfortunately, mm. like, you know, these people have, you know, they have bad energy. They, mm. they, they, they are absent when they should be present, and then they don't get the books. And that's then a pity. It's like, because know? that was was a Namibian. That's a pity. Um, oh, wait. Okay, then another. I think we've got a winner here. Time. Who is actually in the UK? Who is an academic? I see. Madhu Krishna, are you around? Madhu, I thought I saw you. Yes, she was was there. Yes, Madhu is a yeah. winner. Please, Madhu and uh, Nachanda, send me your mailing details so that I can send to Jennifer's publishers and you can get a copy of your book. Uh, next winner is, ah, my God, this guy is rigging. Ndegwa Nguru wins again. Ndegwa, how did you win again? I won with this the is some rigging. Two, yes! Yeah. <laughs> two on two. How do you two do on this? Two. It's what we talked about the other day. <laughs> no, this is this is witchcraft. Oh. So we have two winners left. Is this correct? Yeah. Is Jeremiah Angula Angula Halpinge here? Jeremiah. Is Jeremiah here? No, Jeremiah. I didn't see. Did you see a Jeremiah? Did no. The no, 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 no. I didn't see a Jeremiah entering oh, the but, room. Uh, oh, by the way, Madhu says she has a copy. So can you pass that on to someone else? 
Okay. All right. So okay. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have another writer in uh, another winner in lieu of Madhu, um, because she already has a copy. Is Irene Nakito here? Irene Nakito. We've got a Ugandan. Is Irene here? <laughs> Irene Nakito. She was. She was there. Yeah. I don't know. She, okay. she tried to, she tried to re-enter. Maybe she okay. got a problem, but she was here. Okay, so no, no, we'll have Irene. We'll have Irene here. Uh Irene is gonna then get um Madhu's book. So we still have three more winners to um Priscilla Matara. Is Priscilla Matara? She is from Botswana. Priscilla Matara, is she in going once, going twice? Lost no, she was from not. Priscilla. Uh, next, 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 next. Um, There's someone also from Malawi joined us. I forgot to mention Malawi as well. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Truth Smith. Truth Smith. Are you there? Okay, mm. not there. No. Uh, right. Next is um. Next, 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 next. Uh oh, Angie Chavakova. Angie, I saw you earlier. Angie, 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 going once. I saw you earlier, so we're gonna give you that one because mm. I saw you had entered. I let you yeah. in. Yeah. Hello. Oh, you are here. How are you? Congratulations. <laughs> How is Zimbabwe? <laughs> Thank you. Right. So we've got Zimbabwe. We've got Uganda. We've got Kenya as winners. We've got two more, uh, two more prizes. Oh, we've got South Africa as well. So we're left Thank with one person, actually. Only one more person to win. Ah, uh, right. Uh, Philip Ogonda. Ogonda Philip. Was not there. Who? Oh, oh, hey. he? Hello, hello. I'm with him. I'm with him. We are in the same oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right. So, uh, everyone who has won, Philip Ogonda, uh, Nachaza, Angie, um, Ndegwa, ah. and who else? And Irene, Irene Achito, please, please, please either reach me on Facebook or Instagram and direct message me your address and we can mail the books to you. Congratulations to you all. And thank you again for another amazing installment of Virtually Yours. Detlef, your last words. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Susikwa. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, it was a pleasure to listen to you, and I can't wait to get the book uh, First Woman here at our Goethe Institute in Namibia. We will meet again in three weeks already because uh, it's close to Christmas, uh, so we have the December version uh, one week earlier, and our guest will be Tenda Uhuchu. Oh, and, um, oh yeah. Maybe, yeah. Looking forward to that. Maybe if you are all the people there that there, there joined us, uh, can um, if you are fine, can I send you an invitation for that as well? I think you can. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you everybody yeah. for joining us. And yeah. uh, Jen, it's always such a pleasure and such a delight being with you and having a conversation with you. Thank you, my sister. Thank you and thank you for everyone, to everyone who has uh, tuned in. Uh, lovely to see your messages. I wish we had more time to answer all the questions, but we shall see each other, I suspect, sometime. We, we, will, stay, we will stay again three minutes. Um, like last time, we finish with a song uh, so that you can still answer the the chats or have a look in the chats. Uh, I chose for our closing music, Life is Missing You. That was a song, a Namibian song from um, G3. It was a project actually from the Goethe uh, Namibia. Uh, so enjoy the our final song, 
life is missing you and see you next time thank you very much Detlef. why ain't life so pretty like daisies in a field and why if nature singing are people staring cold So, bye bye. Bye, bye. bye. All right, cheers. <laughs>